Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next uh, our next Nice Trans Speaker Series event. Uh, happy for uh, excited about our our discussion today. Uh, we're going to talk going to be talking about career and technical education. So, if that concept is new to you, then you are in for a treat because uh, the folks that we've got talking about this subject tonight, I don't know of any better individuals to be talking about it. So, uh, you, you're you're tuning into a good one today. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with our discussion. My name is Brandon Gossett. I work here in the Nice Trans Center of Excellence in Education at the University of Louisville. Um, each of these uh, speaker series events are actually facilitated by our director in the center, uh, Dr. Geneva Stark. So I'm going to introduce her, tell you a little bit about her before I turn it over to her for our discussion. Uh, Dr. Stark is, uh, again, the director of the Nice Trans Center. She's also a, a, a clinical professor in education leadership evaluation and organization, otherwise known as the ELIAD department here at the University of Louisville. She is a servant leader, a visionary, educator, achiever, collaborator, and problem solver. Native of, of New Orleans, Louisiana, she now resides in Metro Louisville. She received her BS degree from Xavier University of New Orleans, her master's in education from the University of New Orleans, and her doctor of philosophy from U of L. She al she's also a national professional, uh, has a national professional certification in diversity and inclusion. Dr. Stark retired from JCPS after 20, over 25 years of administrative service. Uh, she served as a teacher, assistant principal, then principal at Western High School. She's the first and only African American. Uh, became the first and only African American to serve as president of Kentucky Association of Secondary School Principals. Uh, later moved to JCPS Human Resources Department and served in a variety of roles there. So if she looks familiar to you, uh, that might be where you know her from. She also served as a district administrator in diversity, equity, and poverty department. She's actively involved in local, regional, and national organizations dedicated to diversity, equity, inclusion, and sense of belonging. She serves as diversity, equity, inclusion consultant at local, state, national, and international levels, uh, treasurer on the board of directors of National Alliance of Black School Educators. Uh, and if that's not enough, she's also a member <laughs> of the Louisville League of Women Voters, and the National Council of Negro Women uh, as I like to say, Dr. Stark does not sleep uh, because she does all of that in addition to being our director here. So uh, on that note, I will turn it over to Dr. Stark uh, for our discussion today. Hey, thank you, Brandon, uh, for the introduction. I truly appreciate it. And again, welcome to our guest to the fourth um, installment of the Nice Dream Center Speaker Series. And today's topic is why career and technical education? And as I was stating earlier, career and technical education is near and dear to me because as the principal of Western High School, I had the opportunity to implement um, several career technical programs at that particular time. Um, when I was at Western as um, initially as an assistant principal, and then I saw the whole mech and my mind went like, we can do better than this. You know? So I put in a proposal so that we can change that whole mech to a culinary arts program. And we got the... Um, we got the green light to do that. And so we were able to hire Garrett Sanborn, Chef Garrett Sanborn at that particular yeah. time, who now works, who still works in our district. And he was able to take students and compete at the local, state, and national levels and was able to win. And so many times when, you know, as busy people in school buildings and you don't get an opportunity to eat, those students would bring me lunch. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> you know, so truly, truly appreciate the how the program evolved and then to now know that we have someone who have gone through that program who's now working in Jefferson County Public Schools you know as a chef I think she's at Iroquois High School um thank you mention mm -hmm. that Jody and also we had the opportunity to implement the um so, well, students were able to leave with Cisco certification and computer and design and repair so they was able to leave that you know uh, school with that as well so you know I was able to see that early on that um, everyone does not have to go to a four-year institution, but also there are other skills that they can acquire 
And also, even if they, if they choose to go to a four-year institution, they can make money in these particular areas while they are going to school. So career and technical education was very, very near and dear. And I've been talking to Jody over a year saying, we have to do this. We have to do this, you know, because the question becomes, how do we educate the masses? You know, because we know with workforce development, they are screaming for employers. Yeah. And we have to educate our community to say, these opportunities are available. I can tell you a couple of years ago, I had a, uh, a pipe to burst and a plumber came out just to come out was $200, $200. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm in the wrong business. Yeah. So those opportunities are there. And so I am just simply, you know, honored and uh, to have the panel that's here today because you all are the experts and I want you to be able to to educate individuals in the Nice Trans Center speaker series, our database spans not only at the local level, but also the state level and also at the national level as well. So you have many people across the country that, that tune in or review this you know, as well. So I want to stop here and say thank you, but also give you an opportunity to introduce yourself, um, two minutes, two and a half minutes to say who you are and also what your work is in career technical education. Then from there, we'll go with the list of questions so that we can then in turn educate our community. So Dr. Hargis, we're gonna begin with you. Thank you. Um, historically, uh, from a historical perspective, um, I have a bachelor's degree in accounting and so worked as an accountant for several years and then went back into education. I hold two master's degrees and then a doctorate in educational leadership with an emphasis in Appalachia. Um, I have served as a business teacher in a high school um, principal of an area technology center, and then I went to the state level for KDE and worked as um, an area supervisor over the area tech centers, uh, moved into the division director position, and then most recently into the associate commissioner position. We have the most wonderful team um, in all of the department in the Office of Career and Technical Education. Um, and we're very proud of them. And we work with all of the CTE within the state to help them with curriculum, um, with our career and technical student organizations, and really just to guide the work and advise as needed. The soon to be Dr. Jody Adams. No pressure, thanks. Uh, so my name is Jody Adams. I am a faculty member at the University of Louisville College of Ed, and I'm actually on loan to the Kentucky Department of Ed, uh, where I get to uh, serve as the lead for our teacher induction program for business and industry folks transitioning into the classroom. Uh, we call that occupation-based certification in Kentucky. Uh, so New Teacher Institute is the program that certifies those folks uh, currently, we have about 275 teachers around the state uh, earning that um, certification, and um, it, it keeps me very busy. So it's a, a joy to be able to work with, with an average age of 47 years old. Um, our, our teachers coming into the classroom from the business world, um, get it with, with all of that expertise. Um, it, it's uh, quite interesting work to be able to transition from the real world into the classroom. And so uh, that is something that uh, we work hard to do. There's a team of us um, around the state doing that work. Um, and so I will bounce it to Sheila since she is an alumni of that program mm -hmm. and, and a current teacher uh, here in Louisville. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jody. I am Sheila Marable. I am a fifth year PRP high school graphic design teacher um, with a career change from the university side. Um, also a woman who wears many hats in education. I'm currently a doctoral candidate at Mary State University. Um, you ready to start working my dissertation in educational leadership. I'm also a CTE New Teacher Institute mentor and leader. So I mentor other teachers making a transition into the middle and high school curriculum. And my passion is personal professional development. I like sharing the knowledge in my classroom and with other teachers that are, even teachers that are seasoned. I share my experiences and I'm an advocate for culturally responsive 
pedagogy and effective strategies that they can use in the classroom and beyond. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you have to bounce it to the next person. <clears throat> Ms. Satterwhite. Thank you, Sheila. My name is Reagan Satterwhite. I'm the executive advisor within the Office of Career and Technical Education at the Kentucky Department of Education. Um, in, in this role, I do, I'm also our policy advisor. I actually developed my interest in education policy as a University of Kentucky student when I was working on my bachelor's degree at, in career and technical education. Um, as I served as a student representative uh, on the University of Kentucky CTE advisory board. Um, I got my start as a teacher in Fayette County Public Schools, actually as a culinary arts teacher. So Ooh. Dr. Stark, I loved your examples. And I know those two individuals that you mentioned, they are fantastic teachers mm -hmm. that I have been able to learn from. Mm -hmm. One of the differences between myself and, and those two instructors is that I went through a tradi traditional teacher prep program mm -hmm. at the University of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, we were actually housed in the College of Ag. So we were with all the future ag, ag educators. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in PLCs as a teacher, I was really able to learn from those occupation-based teachers because they came through, through a different route. I'm not a classically trained chef, but I'm delivering the content to secondary students. However, I've been trained in classroom management and pedagogy that they have not. And so being able to collaborate with those occupation-based instructors is, is always great for both sides. Um, and I'm very um, impressed by the work that Jody does with those teachers. Um, in my role now um, at KDE, I've actually spent time as the career and um, technical education program, programs and pathways mm -hmm. manager before I was in the policy advisor role. I'm an advocate for equitable programs. I came from a comprehensive high school, and so we work with our comprehensive high schools as well as our 50 area technology centers. And so increasing communication and the support that we give, no matter the governance of our, our CTE programs in Kentucky, is very important to me. I will pass it to another former co-worker at the mm -hmm. Kentucky Department of Education, uh, Callie Whitaker. Thanks, Reagan. Appreciate that. Um, Kylie Whitaker, former KDE employee, as Reagan said, 19-year veteran at the Department of Education. Uh, the last year and a half, I've been working with Jefferson County Public Schools um, at the Department of Education. I was mainly um, a data uh, manager, uh, career readiness contact, um, anything to do with information and data and improving people's understanding of what makes students successful. Um, after high school. And so um, Jefferson County's hired me to be a career and technical education specialist. Um, in this role, I'm providing all of the equipment and everything that students need in the programs um, across Jefferson County, all 27 of our high schools uh, to build a life um, after high school. Um, I also serve um, all of the data-driven decision-making rules for CTE and making sure that the programs that we offer are actually in demand. Um, and lead to a career for students. Um, and then I build all the systems um, that try to keep teachers from having to spend their time doing paperwork and stuff and allow everything to be automated here so that they can spend their time uh, working with students. And I will jump over to my best friend in the world, Scott Uselis. <laughs> Thank you, Kylie. Uh, I am the... Uh, well, new Kylie Whitaker. Um, I, I took Kylie's position when he jumped to JCPS. Um, very enormous shoes to fill that I do my best uh, daily to fill, but Kylie's a legend at KDE. Um, no, yeah, I'm Scott Uselis. I'm the uh, current data manager, um, the Office of Career and Technical Education. Um, gosh, I go back about 16 years in CTE. Um, I was a CTE teacher for eight plus years in uh, Shelby County Public Schools and uh, also through the Shelby County Area Technology Center. So one of our uh, state operated centers. Um, I was a business and IT teacher um, in those schools and loved it, enjoyed it, um, made an impact. But then I decided to join the department to try to make a statewide impact as opposed to um, on the small level to, to try to make a difference at the state level. 
and uh, came in as a program consultant. Sheila was one of my one of my teachers in uh, media arts. I remember her coming on. She's gosh, proud of you. That's great. <laughs> All that uh, you've accomplished and. Wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool to see Sheila. And uh, I worked with media arts and IT teachers for about four years mm -hmm. and uh, then transitioned over to the data side, over to the dark side mm -hmm. um, to, you know, really dig into some things. And that's something actually I hope we'll have a chance to get into is some of the great data and some of the great uh, talking points that CTE has that many of your average folks don't know about or maybe don't realize about students in career and technical education. It's it's not the same old vocational education that maybe we remember as kids. So there's uh, some really compelling data points of uh, successes from kids, but um, Really, I'm in charge of any sort of anything to do with CTE data, data reporting. If you're familiar with the Carl Perkins uh, federal program, federal legislation, any data collection around that, um, any data we collect at the state level around CTE usually falls under my purview. Mm -hmm. um, so dual credit, uh, I kind of wear a lot of hats mm -hmm. um, at, at this point. Um, I am actually uh, leaving the department next week. Um, I've accepted a job in JCPS and uh, excited to move over there as well. Uh, we'll miss I'll miss the team greatly here, mm -hmm. but lo looking, I know, gosh, I'm being <laughs> hugged one way by Kylie and Beth. And the, it's, a, it's an interesting time to be on this right now, but um, no, I'll always, hold it dear to my heart it, it, it's it means a lot to me and uh, I always like to look at the kid it, it's not just data points these are kids that, that we're dealing with and I always try to remember that it's not just numbers on a page these are children and uh, we need to make sure they're as successful as they can be so um, thank you Scott we'll take it back <laughs> appreciate that and yep. we know the panel and I know what CTE is you know, but many people don't know what that means. So Dr. Hargis, can you share with the audience, what is CTE or career technical education? What does that mean? Thank you. Well, you know, CTE has been around forever, literally forever. You know, when you think about it, um, from the beginning of time, you know, we've been creating things, we've been making things. Um, from the, in the United States, um, again, it's been around since the founding of the United States and probably made the first massive move um, becoming known uh, around the, the country uh, following World War I. So, um, and, and it's continued to spread, um, you know, especially, you know, following the Industrial Revolution, you know, and it's, it's teaching, and really it's more than just teaching students a trade. Um, one of the things that we were very proud of is that students that are in career and technical education today, they're getting leadership training. So it's not just about learning a skill. They're learning the soft skills. They're learning how to communicate, how to uh, think critically, problem solve, how to work in a team. And, you know, as you know, employers today will tell us, you know, we want students that are going to show up every day on time, drug free. And so while, you know, we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of competition in some of the homes, you know, because we can't fix, we can't always fix that, but yet we can teach the kids and demonstrate that to them in the classroom on a daily basis. So, the, you know, we believe that every student would be better served if they can participate in career and technical education. And I want to point out too that today's CTE is not the same CTE that we had just, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, one of the things that is really a pet peeve of all of us in the department is that sometimes we'll hear the word vocational or voc ed. And we, we hate that word because we believe that we are um, technical education. And that's not just factory jobs. And by the way, factory jobs, um, my dad worked in a factory, retired from a factory. Um, and and the, where he worked at that time was actually kind of dark and and, and, you know, it was dirty. And that's not the same factory that you have today. Um, it, it's changed significantly. And so we need to change how people are thinking about it. It's a positive place to be. But then I also wanted to point out that when you look at professional careers, physicians, nurses, engineers, 
you know, in our minds, we kind of elevate those careers and that's career and technical education. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jody. Uh, um, Kylie, anything you would like to add to that? So I would love to. Um, my background here is uh, what I use to just explain CTE to people that are not in career and technical education. Uh, CTE is, if you could see the whole thing, is purpose-driven education. That's what it is. Uh, the goal of it is to get to this red center, which is to help students find out what they love, what they're great at, what the world needs, and what they can be paid for. And so when you get all four of those things together, you lead to um, a successful life for students after school. And so this is what CTE does on a daily basis. This is what CTE accomplishes every single day in the classrooms. We're teaching students what they're great at. We're finding out what they love. Actually, we're doing a lot of finding out what they don't love. That way they can make those decisions while they're still in school and they don't make those decisions after they get into their adult life. But in addition to that, we're making sure that the programs we offer are programs that lead to things the world needs and things that uh, the kids can get paid for. And so um, whether that's going on to college and getting a post-secondary degree, whether that's going directly into the workforce, all of our pathways are designed to lead into every one of those options, um, but they all have to lead to something the world needs and the students can get paid for. So uh, my one of my mentors, Kevin Fleming, best person in the world about talking about uh, how to apply data to the real world, uh, showed this Ikigai uh, um, chart and I've used it ever since to describe mm -hmm. this is CTE, this is education. And by the way, I think e CTE and education are one and the same. You can't have one without the other. Thank you very much. Um, um, Jody, anything you'd like to add or maybe just talk about the, the number of instructors um, across the state that's in um, that's involved in CTE. I know you mentioned some of that early on. But. Sure, so um, the only thing that I would add to that is that um, we could spend this whole mm -hmm. session talking about the research behind why CTE works mm -hmm. uh, and the value it, it adds to students' lives. Um, the, the amount of students that transition out of a CTE classroom in a, in a school building into a job or into a, a college, a successful college experience, uh, or into the military and have a successful experience in the military. Um, but it really comes down to kids and what they what they are provided with uh, and what they can take out of the building into the into the world. Uh, and so we've all seen successes uh, and experienced that. And so we're just thankful to be able to to have a platform to be able to share that information um, because it. It is uh, it, it it makes a difference in students' lives, and so uh, there are uh, thousands of CTE teachers across the state. Uh, it's it's a wide range, um, uh, and many of what you wouldn't consider CTE. Beth kind of touched on it earlier when she was talking about engineering, um, business, and marketing. I taught uh, in a business and marketing class for for eight years, uh, and my students transitioned into. Um, a four-year university typically. And so many people don't think of that as a CTE and you couldn't get any more career and technical ed uh, than what they experienced in my classroom with uh, participation in career and technical student orgs uh, and being able to converse with adults uh, at, at any given moment, uh, being able to show up to a job interview, uh, looking sharp and sounding sharp and being sharp. Mm -hmm. uh, those experience, mm -hmm. those experiences they they got in a CTE uh, classroom. I know Sheila's going to talk a little bit about her her rock star kids mm -hmm. um, that she works with every day. Um, but that's what it's really about is um, is giving these students an opportunity that they don't they wouldn't necessarily get uh, in another classroom environment. And and I'm going to throw out this question as you stated that um, students would, wouldn't otherwise get that, but the key is the exposure. You know, how do we expose them to the many opportunities that's available? Uh, because sometimes there are so many jobs out there and people say, well, they don't even know that some of these jobs exist. How do we expose them to the jobs that's available, you know, to, in schools and that's available in the work, with workforce development or swimming for in, um, different individuals? How do we expose them to those opportunities? What strategies or what are we using to expose them to these opportunities? Anyone can answer that question. 
Well, I think one of the keys to that is business and industry partnerships, mm -hmm. making sure that our schools are not standalone silos, that they're working with the community and working with all of our business and industry in the community and bringing that into the school. That helps, like you said, um, bring that in front of students, let them get to know what's out there, learn more about the different careers that are out there. Beth said something earlier about factories no longer looking the same as they used to. The best way to get students to understand that's to let our business and industry partners come in and show them or take them to our business and industry partners and I'll let them see um, what some of the modern factories look like. Um, so I, I just think that, and that's one of the things CT excels at is just that business and industry partnership, bringing those people into education and bringing education into the business and industry so that we are all working together um, towards the same goal. You can't do it by ourselves. Our teachers can't do it by themselves. Business and industry are not going to be able to reach these students without us. And so um, one of the best things CTE does is combine those things. Um, won't get into the academies of Louisville right now, but I will say that um, the academy model that uh, Jefferson County has and other districts in the state have are centered around that business and industry support and partnership and can't, can't express how important that is. Yeah, we also you. believe at the department, if I could just touch on this, that it's important to get that career exploration started early, even, you know, in the, in the elementary school, um, you know, they, elementary school children often go to um, fire departments or, you know, somewhere like that to, to take a field trip. So why, you know, we, we really need to be talking to them when they're going there. It's more about just looking at all of the, you know, the big fire engines, but let's talk about the career choices mm -hmm. and what's available to them. And so we really push that um, as, and, and it is difficult sometimes to, to get the word out as far as these are the programs and pathways, and this is what it really is. Mm -hmm. But we also uh, promote very heavily work-based learning opportunities whether it's apprenticeships, co-ops, um, or cooperative learning experiences, or internships. And we believe that if you can get those students into those business and industries, just like Kylie said, and partner with them, they're going to have a better feel for what's available, and that's going to help them make their, their lifelong choices. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Sheila, um, um, how did you get into CTE, and what, was, what drew you to CTE? Uh, for me, make sure my mic is on. For me, um, I teach graphic design, but my previous role, I worked with a lot of customers, and that's my my social skills and how I apply that information to the job that I do. So when I what happened was the position that posted a friend that shared on Facebook one day that PRP was looking for a graphic design teacher, and at the time I was like don't want to make a career change from the university level to high school. And I talked to my students about biases because I had formed a bias about teaching high school. And I shared it with my students that I felt like high school wasn't for me. That wasn't my, my target that I wanted to do in my career, my span of my career. And my students said, well, Ms. Marable, you had already judged us before you even had a chance to meet us. Mm -hmm. So how was that fair? And I'm like, you're right. But once <laughs> I got into the classroom, I quickly learned that what I thought it was gonna be was not what it was. It was not my reality. Before I could even start teaching, mm -hmm. I had to learn about my students and what they liked or dislikes, what they were interested in. And you often hear the term building that relationship. Mm -hmm. That's what I had to do for several weeks before I could even start teaching. And once I did that, then I found that, oh, well, let me start adding in this extra stuff. Because with me, you're going to learn about contracts. You're going to learn about wills and living wills and car maintenance. Today was car maintenance. And they're like, well, what's this have to do with graphic design, Ms. Marable? <laughs> and somebody spoke up and said, she's teaching us life skills. <laughs> One day I had a parent email me when school ended, she's like, hey, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, because I learned some things about cars today that my daughter came home and told me about mm -hmm. that I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. So it's beyond the, the the content that we teach. It's everything in a nutshell that we teach in CTE. Um, I'm a member of a lot of uh, Facebook groups, and a lot of times I see uh, people are saying, they need to bring back vocational school. They need trades, they need trades. I just go to the website, get my link, posted in the thread, we have that, we're doing that. This is what it is. And I get, oh, we didn't know that. So 
I'm there. I'm everywhere I can be advocating for CTE. And, and, and that's the key is that how do we um, educate the masses who don't know, you know, what CT is? And, and that's I mean, all of our charge, you know, as we do this work. Um, Scott, you mentioned about data, you know, and that you're the keeper of the data and you had to fill in those big shoes for Kylie, you know. So what is your role with the data? How do you make sure, how do you ensure that the data is collected? And what do you do with that data to look at programs? Well, Big question, but um, <laughs> we get so much data it would blow your mind, <laughs> but, um, you know, we're collecting it from multiple different angles for multiple purposes. So, uh, for instance, we report out on there's a federally mandated uh, school report card. There's a Kentucky school report card that we have to report out on that for multiple CTE data points, um, you know, uh, participation those that are reaching uh, concentrator status, which is two or more credits in a pathway, those reaching completer status. And one thing I'll touch on, and I know there's a many, many different directions I could go here, but um, that seems to be the special sauce for seeing success for kids after high school is reaching completer status. And what we mean by that is four credits in a pathway that you see it as a true career pathway, not as electives, not I'm, I'm taking this, this, and this, and uh, kind of dabbling all over the place. Like we said, there, there's a time for that exploring and exploring and seeing kind of what we're passionate about. But if you can really get uh, focused and that once you're in high school and reach that completer status and something else that you all touched on, work-based learning. So if they're a completer and they can get some form of work-based learning, whether that's internship, co-op, et cetera, you should see the outcomes for it. And Kylie could, Kylie knows all about this, but uh, we have what's called the CTE feedback report that's publicly facing that will show you, um, regardless of the region of the state of Kentucky you're in, you could be in Eastern Kentucky, Western Kentucky, Louisville, Lexington, anywhere, kids that complete pathways and have work-based learning outperform their peers, just about any group you can think of. CTE completers outpace all of them in terms of, and what I mean by that is in terms of median income mm -hmm. in the level that they're employed, if you look at uh, the employment rate, they outshine kids that are not in CTE. Uh, and it's graphically available. Like you can see it by region, what these kids are making. And what's really cool about that is that's real longitudinal data. And that's stuff that we talk about sometimes like, oh boy, I wish I could see where my kids are after they leave me. Well, Kentucky Stats, I'll put in a plug for them. KY Stats is incredible. We partner with them a lot. They have incredible systems that can help you um, find out what your kids actually get into, how much money they're making, all of those sorts of things. And like I said, it's... Um, and I know I'm going on and on about this, but, but that is, if I could say one really important data point at the high school level, getting kids to complete their status and having them complete some form of work-based learning is really setting them up for uh, future success. And when you say um, four classes, that means one class in the freshman year, one sophomore, one junior, one senior, or can they double you up in the way? They can. Uh, normally, I mean, ideally, it would be one per year. But uh, as anyone on here could tell you that's it's been in the classroom. Uh, yeah, they certainly could, depending on, on where they're taking the coursework. So if it's through an area technology center or a career and technical center that are uh, CTE centers, sometimes they're there for maybe half a day and they can knock out several of those credits at one time. In comprehensive high schools, I would say Kylie could probably speak better to this in Jefferson County and so on, but uh, it's probably normally one class per year to reach that completer status. And uh, toward the end of that completer status, again, getting in that work-based learning and really getting their feet wet uh, in that chosen career uh, really does seem to have an effect. Do we have the numbers of how many completers? We do. We do. And in fact, uh, I mentioned Kentucky School Report Card. That, that is, um, that's a data point you can look at by a school, district, or state. So if you want to see the state numbers, it'll give you the breakdown of the number of kids that reached completer status, those that reached what we call concentrator status, which is two or more credits, 
And then what we have what's called exploring, basically where they take one course and then don't go any further. Uh, you can see that broken up in like a donut chart. And if you were wanted to know about Jefferson County Public Schools or you wanted to know about Western High School or any place, you can look it up on school report card and it will tell you the breakdown of the graduating class of the previous year and the percentages that reach that particular status. So yes, that, that is publicly available. Okay, yeah. and for the audience too, how would they, how would they get there? Sure, um, that's kyschoolreportcard.com, kyschoolreportcard.com. It'll have a search engine at the top. You type in, you know, what district you wanna see, what school you wanna see, and it'll pull up more than that. Uh, it'll pull up at <laughs> more data points than you'd ever wanna know about, probably about a school or a district. Some of them related to CTE, some of them related to, uh, you know, multiple other, uh, categories of education. Um, but yes, th that's a fantastic resource that not enough people know about. And we probably don't do the greatest job. Thank you, Brandon. I see that you just posted a link to it. Um, it that's certainly something that if I'm a, and I'm a parent of two young kids, but uh, I'd want to know about, you know, how schools are performing in these particular ways. Are they getting their kids to complete or status, things like that. Okay. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Ms. Reagan, we're talking about policy, you know, and with that, what policies are in place for those maybe companies or organizations or, uh, that want to connect with, or want to become a CTE site? You know, mm -hmm. what happens with that? What's the policy surrounding that? Because I have a manufacturing company or I have a, some type of business, but I want to expose students to CTE. Yeah. What is that process? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, um, this is very re relevant to our work right now. Um, we are working on our, our work-based learning uh, mm -hmm. regulation and statutes. Um, and, and one thing with that is we have updated our Kentucky work-based learning manual. Um, this is going to actually be effective on um, the 31st of this month. We are so excited about this work. Mm -hmm. It is incorporated by reference into statute, and that's why it had to go through a legislative process. Mm -hmm. um, also, work-based learning is um, a, now a measure of um, career readiness in Kentucky's uh, accountability system. So students that complete a work-based learning experience that have a successful completion of that experience and satisfy a number of hours in their placement are now deemed career ready as a post-secondary readiness measure. Um, and so this has involved a lot of work with many partners, um, our business and industry partners, our school partners, as well as partners at the education and workforce development uh, cabinet. And so we've had um, labor experts, labor department experts on here, um, this committee that have worked with us on this work. And so we welcome any business and industry partner to take a co-op student or an internship student to take to work with our track program, our tech ready apprentices apprentices for careers in Kentucky. Um, and we guide those employers through the steps that they need in order to facilitate a, a successful experience for the student, as well as for themselves so that they get benefit out of this partnership as well. Um, one thing that we're doing in order to promote work-based learning, because as Scott said, we know that students are successful when they not only complete a pathway, but that it involves um, some immersion in that career, is um, we're just highlighting it. And one of the things that we're so excited about is um, we're having a CTE showcase at the Kentucky State Capitol on February 21st. Um, and this is going to be a, a wonderful showcase there's going to be 32 of Kentucky's over 130 career pathways that are showcased showcased at this event, mm -hmm. um, and these these guys are impressive. These these pathways that we have at these schools are phenomenal, um, and so that event is going to start with a proclamation from the governor of February as Career and Technical Education Month, mm -hmm. and we're also going to have. Um, some remarks by House Education Chair, um, James Tipton. Mm -hmm. And um, we are just so excited to show the public and we're inviting any business and industry partner that we that we can get the message to, to please come see the opportunities that are available for Kentucky 
businesses and industries in our secondary schools. So the possibilities are endless. And, and we even have our logo for the Office of Career Technical Education. Um, and I'll drop it in the chat for the visual people, but our logo is Kentucky CTE M powered, empowered. And so the EM at the front of our logo mm -hmm. stands for employers and the ED at the end stands for education. And so when employers and education come together, mm -hmm. Kentucky's empowered. So well, I will say I get goosebumps Megan, actually when I think about that. Yeah, that um, if you share that information with me, I can um, use the nice trans in the platform to send it out to everyone to make sure, well, to raise the awareness that maybe some people may be able to attend. So I don't mind um, using the nice trans in the platform to um, support. Um, um, that would be people. wonderful if you would disseminate that information. No problem. Thank you. We'll be happy to do that. Yeah. But may I add one, one thing to that? And I apologize for jumping in. Okay. Um, I forgot to mention this. We have what's called an employer connector tool, and I really want to plug this as well, and I, I can put the link in there. Mm -hmm. It is maybe one of the, the coolest resources that we have. Mm -hmm. um, it's geocoded, so you can put in your zip code. If you're an employer, mm -hmm. you can go to this site, put in your zip code, and it will tell you within a 10-mile radius, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. um, the schools that teach what your career is aligned to, and it'll actually say how many kids are co-op eligible at that school. So if you're right down the road from, I don't know, Butler High School, and Butler High School has a health science program and you are in that sector, it will say, uh, we have 26 kids that are co-op eligible at this school. It helps make that connection because sometimes as an employer, you don't even know where to begin. Right. Like, who do, who do I talk to? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's a great tool that can really help make those connections with school. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wanted to give a plug to that as well. Thank you. No problem. And again, I'll be happy to share that information because I realize that we have to, um, we need all hands on deck. You know? Absolutely. And it's a collective effort and we definitely love to be a part of that. Um, Ms. Sheila, tell, tell me some success stories about your students you know, um, at PRP. Okay, I'll, I have a few. Mm -hmm. um, we had our staff sergeant come out this week from the Army National Guard. Mm -hmm. And some students are not aware that the Army National Guard provides career opportunities. They didn't know. And she went over the benefits, um, the requirements, the expectations. And before she left, she had like maybe 20 students who wanted additional information. So that's one success story because without that connection, without that exposure, they wouldn't have known or they would have found out about it later. A lot of times I hear people say, now what do you teach? Man, I wish they had that in school when I was in school because mm -hmm. I would have done something totally different. Mm -hmm. I have another student who I am the teacher that students stay connected with. Mm -hmm. I get a text that, hey, you know, you taught me how to do sublimation in the classroom. I now have a side business using that same process that you taught me. Mm -hmm. And then he went, thank you. I was like, mm -hmm. okay. And I got a couple of students that are majoring in graphics at UofL or have gone to other universities to, to major in it. But the main thing is the, student are get, the students are getting that exposure, awareness, and then application of what, they pick, what they're picking up in school and they're taking it beyond the classroom. Another success story is had several students who won full rides, full tuition uh, scholarships at UofL, but nothing graphics they plan to go into teaching and learning. And they said, without having that exposure and connection about life skills, social skills, how to have a resume cover letter, how to project their voices when they're speaking to an audience, how to build up that confidence, they wouldn't have taken that pathway. Um, anytime a student graduates, to me, that is a success story because some of the things that they encounter, I have to keep in mind that everybody's home life is not the traditional home life for a lot of our students. So when they can overcome their challenges and the things they have going on at home and bring that out in the classroom and go, get beyond the barriers that are there for them, that's a success story. And anymore, what is traditional? <laughs> uh, traditional. No, no, I'm just saying the word that's just rhetorical. Not all gonna students are going to go to college. Yeah. No, you said traditional. Right. Uh, life. Yeah, yeah. It's um, 
finding out how my students are navigating these spaces in the classroom environment. Mm -hmm. Where are we losing her a little bit? It's different. She'll so be in open and, and inclusive. I teach. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're going in and out on this. <laughs> yeah, it says my internet connection is unstable. Um, I don't know where it ended, but um, the way I teach and what I bring into the classroom and my strategies that I use, mm -hmm. I have to be equitable and inclusive. I can't teach the same way. I can't expect everybody to read and understand what they read. So I make sure that when I say success, that student has to demonstrate to me how they're picking up what I'm throwing down. And it might be through writing, it might be through a video, it might be through a podcast. However, they can demonstrate that they understand the standards that I'm covering in my, my class. Can y'all still hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. What is the new skills for youth programs? Jody, what is that program? Or Kylie, what is, what is, what is that program? So New Skills for Youth was a federal grant mm -hmm. um, that Kentucky Department of Ed, Officer Kern Technical, Technical Ed uh, was one of the grantees. Um, and Scott could probably speak a little bit better to it or Kylie, mm -hmm. um, but the grant was designed to, um, to, to push forward the concept of um, career academies. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was, a, there was um, three years is it still in place or is it no longer in place? So the grant uh, was a was a, a close ended grant. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a grant for three years, mm -hmm. uh, and we have uh, I think six or seven um, really successful stories from that grant work where communities kind of came together and have created a, an environment where uh, students are getting career and technical ed uh, at a different level than they were before. Uh, and so that collaboration and community um, that pulled together some different districts and buildings uh, really um, labeled the grant work as as hyper successful, uh, in my opinion. Beth, did you want to did you want to add some to that? Well, I would, I would say that there were three cohorts that um, received this planning grant. And so, again, it was, as Jody said, they worked with um, other educational facilities within, within the region. So there was a post-secondary connection. It might be multiple districts coming together. And the whole point of it is to, you know, to, to share resources. Mm -hmm. And so you may have um, the districts are providing perhaps academic teachers in the career and technical education center. That's one example. And it, when you're doing things like that, it really provides the opportunity for the academics to be taught through the lens of CTE, which really makes it more relevant. Um, you know, it, it also it also opened up people's eyes as far as the different districts to, you know, we can work together to increase the opportunities for students. And so it could be that you're going to this building, you're going to this district to take this course or you're going across town to take another, you know, to get the other courses that you need. But it was all about sharing of resources and coming together to benefit the students. So while the grant is no longer, um, the, the funding is no longer there, but we still have some of the academies that are still in place and doing well. Um, and they they really all look differently because um, as you, as um, JCPS can certainly um attest to, you know, it depends on the location as to what this actually looks like. And so there are a lot of different models across the state, but theoretically it is a wonderful, uh, wonderful concept. Okay. Good a couple of other Ali. things I would just okay, jump in yes. on that one, if you don't yes. mind. Yes. Is... Yeah, I was calling on you. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect timing. I, I, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that um, are still in place from New Skills for Youth that I think are super important in our state. Uh, one was that um, all pathways that you have to that you offer are based on labor market data that shows that they're in demand and high wage. And so Kentucky went through, we were one of 10 states to receive the grant, but we went through an extensive process of reviewing every one of our career pathways here in the state and looking at labor market data from the Kentucky Center for Statistics to ensure that everything we were offering was leading to something for students after high school. Um, that it wasn't a dead end, that it was like really going to pay well or really leading to a lot of jobs that were out there. And so that's one of the big benefits that came out of that, that actually ended up in legislation um, 
that we use labor market data here in the state um, from that point on. Another thing that came out of that was credentials of value, uh, making sure that uh, students that leave our programs are earning those credentials that help them get a job or get college credit or a, a myriad of uh, things after high school, um, but making sure that those credentials we were offering were vetted um, by business and industry and were vetted by our Kentucky uh, Workforce Innovation Board. Um, so both of those are in legislation today because of new skills for youth. Um, and I think those are two of the things that have really pushed Kentucky ahead of most states um, in our career pathway offerings. So I just, I can't leave new skills for youth without um, talking about those two major impacts it made on the work we're still doing today, whether or not we have a grant um, anymore. Did anyone else want to jump in on that before? I would just add that um, as part of the grant work, uh, we've looked at a lot of different processes and policies that were already in place mm -hmm. uh, to see if those were detrimental to that collaboration uh, or uh, encouraging that collaboration. And I, and I know for New Teacher Institute, uh, it, it forced um, a benchmark and a goal for us to hit um, that was, that was um, concrete. And so all, uh, all of the things that we did in New Teacher Institute uh, were examined to see how that activity or that uh, event contributed to meeting those benchmarks. Uh, whereas that analysis was not there before uh, that grant was was um, given to us. So uh, it really gave us an opportunity to look at some of the things that we were doing uh, and see how we could improve upon those. Uh, and, you know, very rarely do we have opportunity for assessment, uh, you know, program assessment, self-assessment. Uh, and, and through that grant, uh, we were able to, to make the time and force the time. Uh, to be able to look at a lot of the stuff that we did. Okay. One thing I would also like to just contribute to this because um, it's a big deal today. Mm -hmm. And it's not, New Skills for Youth was not the only thing that went into this. So I'll say that out loud and publicly, but I can tell you that it had a huge impact on the Kentucky Dual Credit Scholarship and the Work Ready Scholarship that are available for students today. Um, New Skills for Youth wanted to make sure that we were embedding academics, dual credit, and those post-secondary opportunities for all students. We worked with legislators um, and with the governor at the time to uh, really push dual credit in the state of Kentucky. Um, and it's made such a huge impact um, on this state. The, uh, I, I, can't, I can't even remember at this point how much dual credit increased as a result of the dual credit scholarship and the work ready scholarship. Um, without that, we'd have a lot of students that would not be able to take college classes while they were in high school or take college uh, degree programs after high school because they can't afford it without that. And so um, those are just a few of the things that New Skills for Youth brought to the state of Kentucky and just have a lasting impact um, moving forward. And so uh, can't, can't leave the subject without at least mentioning dual credit as well. Absolutely. Uh, and again, this is um, informational for the people that's out there because so um, the new skills skills for youth program was like a foundation that you've been able to build upon, uh, which is amazing. So um, Kylie, um, you're now in JCPS, Jefferson County Public Schools. Give us an overview of the CT program and where you know where we are as a district and and moving forward, um, goals and expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, CT in Jefferson County is. I thought that it was uh, a huge machine when I worked at the state. Um, and, but since I've been in Jefferson County, I've learned that um, even though the school district might not be as large as the state, uh, there's a lot of moving components to it. So for CTE in Jefferson County, we have several different models. Um, so at some of our alternative schools, um, we have the big picture process where students are learning um, while working, while going to school. Um, it's all part of their everyday high school um, schedule. And then we have a 15 Academy of Louisville schools where the entire um, high school is designed around the CTE programs that are offered in those high schools. You have your academics and all of your CTE and smaller academies, which um, breaks those um, school environments down into smaller learning environments, which allows all the teachers to get to know their students together and work with the same students, which allows you to brainstorm when students are having um, troubles in one of the classes and 
uh, find out what they're really good at, what they're enjoying, where their skills and their goals are at. Um, and so the, the Academy of Louisville's uh, the 15 Academy of Louisville schools, um, they're completely based around CTE. Yes, they're still traditional academics in those schools, but it, it's all wrapped up in the CTE. It's a beautiful program um, and it's made a world of difference for Jefferson County. And then we also have just your traditional high schools that are still offering CTE programs um, in those as well. And so those would be more like the traditional programs where the students are going um, to the high school they're taking their normal programs, but they're also taking the CTE pathway at the same time. Um, and so it comes in a lot of different forms in Jefferson County, um, but we have seen the best results um, that we've ever had in Jefferson County since the Academy of Louisville um, initiative was brought on board where our post-secondary readiness scores have just skyrocketed. Um, last year was our best ever. The year before that was our best ever. The year before that was our best ever. Um, so we've continued to improve every year. Um, one of the major things that we're working on right now. I could talk about this stuff forever, by the way. We have so much going on in Jefferson County, but I will tell you about one project that we have going on in Jefferson County right now that I think is just huge. And that's, we call it classroom, classroom improvement. But what, basically what we're doing is we're going into every CTE classroom and making their equipment state of the art based on what's currently in business and industry, making sure that our students have access to every one of those things. Um, and making sure that the environment um, makes them want to be there. And so when they walk into a CTE classroom in Jefferson County, we want them to be like, wow, this is the coolest place in this building. Um, and so we've been putting so many resources. Thankfully, the state put a lot of resources behind CTE this past year. We still have Federal Perkins putting resources. And thankfully, Jefferson County, Marty Polio, shout out to him. They've put a ton of district resources towards CTE as well. And so every one of our classrooms after next year will be state of the art. When you walk into them, you will not be seeing a traditional classroom setup. You won't be seeing traditional computers in there. What you'll see is what you see in business and industry in every one of our classrooms. And so just so excited about that. I think that's gonna make a world of difference for culture and climate um, in our building and sense of belonging for our students and just making them feel uh, like they wanna be there every day. And so I'm just super excited about that, um, but I'll stop. I could talk about this a lot, but it's just a lot going on in Jefferson County every day. Absolutely. And um, as you talk about the physical space, and right now we know in our country, we all are dealing with the, the mental piece, you know, of uh, our mental uh, well-being. Um, for CTE, is there something that you are doing specifically to make sure that students and uh, the staff and students are, uh, have a sense of belonging or dealing with their um, mental well-being um, as well? Is there something that you all are doing specifically for that? Mm -hmm. And anyone can can jump in here. Well, I, I was Go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, I, let me just start it just uh, very quickly. I know at the state level we have spent um, we've gone through extensive trainings, mm -hmm. trying to you know that work life balance and trying to uh, make sure first well that our teachers are taken care of along with our students. Mm -hmm. We know that at the um, that the the school level it's it is difficult because our guidance counselors are covered up. You know our youth services centers are covered up. And so we are relying a lot on our CTE instructors because they're the ones that have the relationships with those students and can probably best identify uh, the students that are at risk. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, we're trying to make the appropriate connections. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that there is a systematic approach across the state that everyone is using, utilizing, but we are um, we are providing training and you know tr and trying to make people aware of it. And I think awareness of the situation is, is probably um, the, one of the most important steps. But you have to realize there's an issue before you can figure out how to fix it. So, Kylie, mm -hmm. no, thanks, Beth. I, I was just going to say the CTE is um, the whole purpose behind CTE is to bring a sense of belonging. Uh, to students. So we um, worked really hard with middle schools to help students do some exploration, find out what they're wanting to do when they are in middle school. That way when they get into high school, they can go into a program that excites them every single day. Uh, we know that students that are excited to be in their programs have better behavior. They have better attendance than other students. They want to be in their schools. I can't tell you the number of gen ed teachers I've talked to that um, envy our CTE teachers because of how excited the kids are just to be in the classroom 
how much they want to be in those classrooms and how their whole attitude and demeanor changes. And so um, while I agree with Beth, there's no uh, common thread every single CTE program is doing across the state. The one common thread I can tell you is that the whole purpose of CTE is to help those students feel like they belong there and that that school is uh, really doing something for them day in, day out. Um, and our data backs that up um, more than anything else that I can, I mean, that that belonging data is just so important in making sure that students want to be there um, and that they're dying to come to the class every day. Oh, I can't wait to get into that class because I get to do this and I love doing this. And so um, I just think CT in general, and I don't want to, I don't want to downplay the mental health stuff, but I just want to say that that's, why CTE is so important in every one of our schools is that it does create that sense of belonging and that excitement for the students to be there every single day. Okay, thank you, Scott. Do you want to chime in? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, kudos to, to what Kylie said. Um, one thing I think we do need to look at um, that I just was thinking as Kylie was talking, um, Opportunity gaps for for kids. Um, mm -hmm. If you were to look at Kentucky as a state, we're very representative. Uh, CTE. If you were to look at racial, gender, we're right on par. Like if you were to look at the percentage of uh, white students, African American students, and so on. But as you dig deeper into there, um, we have some stark gaps th th that we need to fix and. Um, the only reason I bring that up, it just we want to make sure that those opportunities are available uh, to all kids, re regardless of gender, race, et cetera. We want to make sure that they are offered the proper opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, like if you were to look at a map of Jefferson County, th there are probably some programs, uh, and, and Kyla, you all are probably doing a great job of trying to address this, but there probably are some places where mm -hmm. certain pathways and programs are not available Mm -hmm. um to certain groups of kids and it, it's just making sure knowing that those gaps exist and uh trying to work hard to overcome those gaps and trying to make sure that um kids have the proper access to those programs that will make them happy and make them want to come to school and, and so on uh is is something important to think about one thing I just want to add on to this topic as well is the role of our career and technical student organizations. Were you going there too, Jody? <laughs> our CTSOs, I mean, they just provide invaluable experiences for students. And in addition to what they do for our students' sense of belonging, they also enhance curriculum. And so our career in, student, in technical student organizations are just absolutely imperative as part of what makes a CTE program a high quality program. Students not only have this, this organization that they have a sense of belonging to, but they're also encouraged to better their communication skills, their leadership abilities, their anything and everything. Um, they have competitive events that students, you know, that might not have an opportunity to be like, maybe they're not athletic, so, but they can really shine and, and, and you know, be successful in those career and student, technical student organizations. So they are a requirement for our CTSA, T, um, our CTE programs in order to receive federal funding, but for very good measure. And um, we'll actually talk to people that are involved in career and technical education at leadership levels, and they'll attribute their desire to enter the field of CTE to their CTSO experience. So many teachers across the state of Kentucky say it was their CTSO and their involvement there that encouraged them to be a teacher. Very good. Um, Can I add on to that? Yes. A sense of belonging, access to resources, a reflection of themselves in the curriculum. When I encourage my students to design, I say, keep in mind your target audience, and you can design when a different language. When you're using photographs, it should be a, a diverse audience of photographs, different cultures and experiences. So when they see a reflection of themselves in the curriculum, they feel like they belong, they feel a connection. And I strongly encourage teachers to start looking at their curriculum and make sure it's equitable, make sure it's inclusive, not just the way the teacher wants to see it, but from your student's perspective. Absolutely, because um, 
first and foremost, we're living in a global society, global. And um, we cannot you know, minimize, you know, that we have people from all walks of life um, that live, you know, in the state of Kentucky and especially in Louisville over the last 10 years, the whole entire community has changed. So we have to be mindful that we are living in a global society and that kids need to be able to see people from all walks of life, you know, in books or in conversations or being inclusive in that whole respect, because the goal is that we want them to be inclusive professionals in their personal and professional life as well. So we have to model, you know, what we want um, to see in them and what we want to see them do, you know, as well. Um, one of the things that um, Jody had mentioned to me was that the opportunities for those CTE teachers in terms of advanced education. And I think Ms. Um, Sheila, you are um, experiencing that. So talk about the, the opportunities, and maybe both of you can talk about the opportunities that we go further with advanced degrees as a result of being CTE teachers. Um, this advanced degree journey has been a, a journey well, within its own. Well, let's talk about the opportunity first about the what it is there. Mm -hmm. um, CTE, for us to advance our degrees, or divine, we have the opportunity for a tuition waiver, which we're losing Sheila. So Jody, you're going to jump in. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, so Sheila, you're going okay. in and out. Yeah. <laughs> so when we um, when we transition New Teacher Institute into um, the current model, one of the things that we were able to do is change uh, the degree requirements. Uh, previously, if you were getting certified through New Teacher Institute, you had to do um, a, a 64 hour planned program. Uh, at, at one of um, several regional universities around the state. And uh, it didn't matter what you already had in, in, in terms of degrees. Um, and so when we, we were able to rewrite uh, the program and the regulation um, surrounding that and changed it to where uh, the, the teachers coming in, if they had a content degree, um, so if a welder had an associate's in, in welding or a nurse had an associate's in nursing, um, they, they had met the degree requirement. And so we took off that extra burden uh, of a 64-hour of a program, uh, and which has enabled a lot of teachers, a lot of new teachers coming in to pursue a degree beyond uh, what would necessarily be their teacher degree. Uh, and so it, it has enabled someone like Sheila, who's got a master's degree already, uh, instead of do, taking time to do that 64 hour planned program, she gets to, to pursue a doctorate uh, in education and um, using a tuition waiver that is available to um, our CTE teachers and uh, further her degree, which opens up a lot of opportunities for CTE teachers that weren't necessarily there before. Um, and so it's also transformed our dual credit opportunities for, for students um, because now those, those teachers that, are, um, that don't have a degree in their content area can pursue that degree uh, instead of the 64 hour planned program. Uh, and that has opened up a lot of dual credit opportunity, um, especially with uh, the community college system in the state uh, and, and has enabled a lot more CTE teachers to, to offer dual credit um, that, that previously were not even able to do that. So uh, it, there's great opportunities, whether, whether a CTE teacher wants to go into administration, uh, there's unique challenges to run in a, 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 a building that has CTE pathways into yeah. it, in it. And, um, and so we've now got CTE teachers that can pursue that principal licensure uh, and don't have as many barriers to do that now. Uh, and so it is, uh, it is, given a lot of opportunity that wasn't there uh, previously. Okay, for, for the experts, and you are the experts, what else should the audience know that I have not asked that you can just share with the audience um, that they need to know? And um, as we, um, we have about um, 20 more minutes, so I want each one of you are just to talk about some things that I have, that we have not discussed that the audience may need to know. And I know that all of you, I can talk about this forever because you're passionate about it. But what are some things that you know you can discuss or share with the audience um, that they need to know about CTE? 
Yeah, so the one thing I'd like to just add on um, here, and it, it's actually near and dear to my heart right now. Uh, we were in a meeting last week where we we're talking about culture and climate, uh, and making sure that the school environment was um, a healthy place for students and adults. Um, Jefferson County's putting some money towards that to make sure that that is reality in every one of our buildings. Um, but in CTE, how this applies is that we have a lot of school-based enterprises in our schools around the state um, that can design and develop, provide lunch for you. If you're, if you're having a catered event, um, they develop, they design t-shirts, they design sweatshirts, they design cups, they make signs, they, they can do so many things. Um, and every time you partner with one of these, you're putting money back into the classroom where they can um, buy more materials to practice hands-on um, and get more life skills, more hands-on skills to improve their um, skills and ability for the future. And so uh, I, I have to mention school-based enterprises and tell people to take advantage of those, reach out to our schools, find out what your schools can do and design. Oh, there's so many Christmas gifts we can design for you guys. Even I know Christmas is already gone, but just a <laughs> shout out for next year. Like our programs are amazing. Our kids are amazing. They can build whole marketing schemes for you. They can design videos to help market your product for you. They can do just about anything there is. And um, we want you to take advantage of our school-based enterprises um, because every time you do that, you're, you're benefiting students and our schools. And so uh, just can't leave the subject of CTE without talking about those, those programs in our buildings. And, and thank you for that, Kylie, because I remember uh, again at uh, uh, Western High School with the culinary arts, um, we almost catered for almost every organization in the area, you know. Right, and yes. so that was a wonderful experience for the students to be able to get that real life, you know, experience of uh, being in um, in venues with business people or different people and getting that experience. And now it's not only preparing the food, but also maybe possibly setting up and serving and the whole bit that goes into that. Yes, you know, absolutely. Yeah, so. you mentioned uh, Chef Sanborn, just just a quick shout out. Like I just sent a job to Chef Sanborn just a little bit ago. Okay. Um, he's at, okay. he's at more culinary right yes. now. And so yes. mm -hmm. uh, just, yes, he's awesome. And, and our programs are awesome. Thanks for absolutely. that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Reagan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things I would just add that we haven't touched base on is um, career technical education's ability to um, facilitate and encourage innovation. Um, we have lots of emerging pathways across Kentucky, emerging career fields. Um, the workforce does not look like it used to 10 years ago. It doesn't look like it used to five years ago. And it especially does not look like it used to pre-COVID. It is all completely changed. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we have the ability to do that we haven't really touched on is allow for schools with their local and regional partners in business and industry to be innovative in their thinking and the career paths that they make available to students. And so we have a process for um, local districts to develop their own local pathways. And as long as they meet the certain criteria that we set forth um, at the state and the federal level for what defines a quality pathway, then those schools are allowed to meet the needs of, of those in their region, of the workforce in their region to develop pathways um, that are, are really specialized to those needs. And so we have some going on right now in logistics, some in aviation, um, some data science pathways that are in the works. There's a pilot, a big um, pilot pathway that's taking place that we're really excited about. Mm -hmm. And so we're giving ownership to these schools and, and, and these businesses in order to, you know, let them develop their, their program of study and we'll just support them along the way. So that's all I'd add. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, you speak about the aviation program, but I'm yeah, I've volunteered for the aviation program for the last 10, 15 years at Shawnee in the summer. And then to know right now, um, um, this summer they were looking for air traffic controllers because there was a shortage, uh -huh. um, you know, to be a shortage. And now um, the pilot shortage and how do we build that, um, the capacity of being able to, say, to capitalize on that. Um, and I saw something, a segment about EKU speaking about their aviation program, I think yesterday on the news. So there are opportunities that we can expose our young people 
to careers um, that they have not even thought about. Yeah, you know? so our office, um, as well as schools mm -hmm. in Northern Kentucky, as well as the Kentucky Chamber Foundation has been working with the CVG airport mm -hmm. on their needs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, to, to allow students to see the inside or, or behind the scenes in an airport, yeah. mm -hmm. you talk about really like blowing their mind and, yes. and, mm -hmm. and exposing them to something that they would not have an opportunity to see and mm -hmm. our educators as well. Um, so it's, it really goes back to that exposure. Um, I think Kylie and Beth both talked about this on, you know, really making sure CTE and I heard this, I, I cannot, call this my own phrase, but from cradle to career. Mm -hmm. And so you really start at the elementary level with awareness mm -hmm. and, and making um, young kids aware that like the sky is the limit when it comes to what they're interested in and what careers are available out there. And then in middle school, you really start the exploration of, of understanding what types of things and what types of skills are required in certain fields. Mm -hmm. And then at that high school experience is really about the immersion in those programs. For me, as a high school student, several years ago, it was my work-based learning experience that uh, kept me from making a really big mistake. I was a cooperative student um, at a CPA firm mm -hmm. and I, for years and years before that, thought that I wanted to be an accountant. I enjoyed the accountants there. They were a lot of fun. I did not dread going to my co-op placement, but I learned that I did not want to be one of them. And so that saved me a lot of money, really. And so for some of our CTE students, that's a positive that comes out of, of their experience. So I, I really... I really, truly just believe and love career and technical education with my whole heart. Mm -hmm. I really think the messaging about career and technical education is so important. We talk about educating the general public that it's yes. not shop class. It's not home ec anymore. Mm -hmm. it, it's way more than that. Mm -hmm. um, we don't need to bring it back. It's here. <laughs> and um, CTE in Kentucky is actually stronger now than it has ever been. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hargis and I go to national conferences and Kentucky sets the bar mm -hmm. in yes. career and technical education. And, and it's not CTE or college. It, it's not. And, and so shifting that mindset, when I think about my two young boys, I don't think about what college are they going to get into or what score are they going to get on their ACT. I dream about them having successful careers mm -hmm. that provide for their family mm -hmm. and, and that make them very happy. So that's so, my that's my soapbox. I'll step off of it. Now. Hey, that, that's OK. Yeah. And that's what it's all about, that they're, they're able to see that um, there's other opportunities that look with their careers. Um, and that's available to them. We just mm -hmm. have to make sure they're exposed to those opportunities. So Scott, um, something that we have not talked about or something that you um, that's burning on your chest that you have to tell the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, several things, several things. Some of them I've touched on, some of them not so much, but I actually wrote down a few notes as we were, as we were talking. Um, one of the most important things, and yes, the day-to-day -day in the classroom, absolutely important, but at the end of the day, outcomes, outcomes data. Um, where do our kids, I remember when I was a teacher, I, I used to, honestly, it would keep me up at night, where are these kids going to end up? Or when they, you know, they step outside that door for the last time, did I do enough to, to make them successful? And um, it's one of those things, it, to me, that, that that's the value of school, right? It is not that we cram their head full of facts and they can regurgitate something back out on an exam. It's, did we teach them the skills so that um, once they step foot out that door the last time for high, at the high school level, are they going to be a success? Do we give them the skills that they need uh, to be a successful member of society? So um, it's, it's really all about those outcomes to me um, in transitioning, but, but um one thing I would want to talk about, uh, those, and again, many people have made mention of this, uh, CTE is not just for kids going directly into the workforce. It's not just for those going into university. It is for all kids. Um, but one thing, uh, in regardless of district you look at, this has to do with outcomes. I'm, I'm 
taking some time to get around to it, but th- this all has to do with outcomes. Those that do go directly to college, right? So we have a ton of kids, about 55% of kids in CTE participate and go directly into a four-year institution or a two-year institution or whatever the case may be. Um, we have some tracking mechanism that, that can show, you know, give them seven years, okay? So class of 2013, okay? By the year 2020, where are they? educationally. And we can see those that never went to a university. We can see those that earned a certificate, earned an associate degree, earned a bachelor's degree or nothing. The largest group, I don't care what district of the 170 plus districts you look at, and I swear this is true, that the largest group of kids are those that go to college and earn absolutely nothing. Okay. That that's concerning. Number one, their earning potential is just slightly better than someone that did only have a high school education. And normally they're going to be saddled with some form of debt. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's work to be done mm-hmm. is we need to have kids. And that's not to say that a post-secondary education is not great. It is. But if that is the route they're going to take, let's have a plan let's have a plan in high school. What do I want to do? What are my interests so that we don't have kids that are just completely ill-prepared going to school and dropping out and really having nothing to show for it except debt Mm -hmm. and uh, really getting more kids uh, to cross that finish line. If they're going to go to school, let's get them completed. Let's get them in a certification program, an associate's degree, a bachelor's and so on, whatever that means for that kid, but uh, setting them up for success. And I think CTE, um, does a really good job of that, of trying to get kids, if you are going to pursue that path, let's have a really solid plan uh, in place. So again, I think all of us are on our soapboxes, but yeah. that, that's, that's mine, is that I, I want kids to be successful when they leave us. And you know, Scott, um, when I'm talking to parents, and even on the plane, I was talking to some individuals, and they said they, they had um, children or their child was going to college, and I asked them, what was the destination job? And me and the parents right. like, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I don't and, know. I said, well, you need to have that conversation. That's right. Them, because and, what is the destination job? Are they just going to be going? And are you just paying money to be paid money? <laughs> you know. And so many of them walked away saying, you know what? Thank you for that. Because now I'm going to go have a real deep conversation yeah. with my child about what is the destination job uh, rather than just be going to be going. Because as a when I was supervisor of the substitute center, there were many people that would come through there that had gone to school or dropped out and um, they always want to teach or do something, but they were just out there, you know? And so trying to figure out what to do at, at various ages. So what is the destination job Absolutely. that um, and parents need to be having or even uh, individuals who are out there, what is your destination job? Mm, Why are absolutely. you there? You know, so, yes. Yeah. Jody. The, the soon to be Dr. Joey Adams. <laughs> so I would only, I, I, two things, I, I would be remiss in my role as the director of New Teacher Institute mm-hmm. if I didn't make a shameless plug for occupation-based teachers. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's lots of jobs open around the state right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I, looking at just jumping on JCPS's website, there's f- five nursing teacher positions available right as we speak. Uh, and w- when those teachers get hired in mid-year, we, we have a plan to drop them into a new teacher institute, get them the resources they need. Um, so an individual just has to have four years of work experience in the content area that they're going to be teaching. Uh, if, it's an, if it's health science or nursing, they need to have an RN, a registered nurse certifi- certification. But for the most part, it's that work experience, four years, uh, two in the last five years. So uh, just need to make sure that I put that plug in there for all of those positions that are available around the state. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that I, that we never touched on, um, we, we danced, we talked a lot about the opportunities for kids. Mm-hmm. Um, Kentucky is leading the, the charge in youth apprenticeships. Uh, we have, um, track, the track program is the tech ready apprenticeships for careers in Kentucky. And, uh, we have high school students going into businesses, getting their hours and in, in, in a registered apprenticeship with the, with the US DOL. Uh, and it's, it, it is a, a program that is modeled around the country. 
Um, and so these are the kind of opportunities that our kids in the, our state are getting um, that they're rolling right into a, a viable career. Uh, and some of them are making more money than any of us on this call. So uh, track is something that uh, I would encourage anybody to look at. Um, there's lots of information on KDE's website. Uh, and it is a high value program um, that is changing kids' lives. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Hargis. Well, I want to say thank you all so much for hosting us today. I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. Uh, Kentucky is absolutely leading the way in CTE, and you learn that it becomes more, um, it, it, you see it when you go to these national conferences and you talk with other states and you realize, you know, it's true, we, we really are leading the way. But I will say that years ago, and I've been, I'll look at my note page over here, but years ago as a principal, you know, that was, I would tell people, you know, CTE is the biggest, that's the best kept secret in education and in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And I will say, I think that's changing, but it's still there. You know, it, it's one of those things where we're overcoming, but we still have quite a ways to go. We've got to get rid of that, that CTE stigma. Mm -hmm. As we've talked about in this, um, in this session, high wages, high demand positions, mm -hmm. we can get kids, we pick kids where they are and we get them where they need to be. We can get them the industry credentials. We can get them the jobs. We can get them the work-based learning experiences. So I, I kind of feel like selfishly that we are the end all for education because we we do it all and we do it well. Um, one thing that I wanted to, uh, to hit on, um, this is a huge priority for us and huge work for us. This past year, the General Assembly um, gave us money to fund all CT in the state. That's the first time this has happened in Kentucky. So it's not just in a locally operated center or a state operated center. CTE programs in comprehensive high schools are being funded. And I can't imagine the significance and relevance of that because when I was a business teacher, I think my budget was made, you know, this was you know, a thousand years ago, but I believe my budget was something like $250 for the whole year. Mm -hmm. And, and so of course, you know, we were working on computers then that were old and there was no plan really to, you know, to update them in the near future. The general assembly saved the day for us, but we, once this biennium budget is over with that money is gone. And so we will be working and are already working to try to get this codified and to work on our funding formula and to make sure that that funding is sustained. And, um, you know, we need examples. And I would ask for anyone that's going to watch this to send us emails. Let us know how you've been spending those funds. How have the funds benefited you? Because we need to know that so that we can relay that information to our General Assembly members and let them know how much we appreciate their support and what kind of impact that that's had. I will also say, and we've touched on this a little bit, but the partnerships with business and industry and with all of our stakeholders, incredibly um, important for us to continue our work. And we, you know, we need to, we all need to think about that to try to get that communication out there. Make sure that we are, we're telling people about CTE. Don't let it be a secret. Get it out um, every way that we can. And again, that's why I appreciate you letting us talk about it because you know we've all got our soapboxes, and and, and in fact, mm -hmm. we share a lot of the same soapboxes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's a CTE is a you know tagline. It's a good thing, you know. It's, but we've got to. We need to keep expanding. We're proud of where we've come from because again, years ago, our biggest problem was begging for students. You know, give me your students. We've got to have them. And seriously. I don't get that complaint anymore. The complaint that I get is we need more programs. We need more access to CTE in our district. And so, it, you know, and that's, that's while it's a problem, that's a much better problem to have than we need students. So we love it. We have fun with what we do and I believe it's a calling. So thank you so much for letting us share. Absolutely. It's no longer a, a dumping ground, so to speak. It is something that um, to be proud of um, something that we need to continue to educate the masses and whatever I can do to use this platform to support CTE, then um, count me in, you know, and I'll be willing to do that because again, I know the the benefits, you know, of CTE and was able to experience it, you know, live, you know, and in color to be able to see it and, and love it. So uh, we have to look at different ways to be able to educate our students and we need all hands on deck. So once again, thank you all, you know, for 
being a part of the Life Strands uh, speaker series. And um, um, that's it. Thank you. Appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Thanks Charles. For having us. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we're going to end here and hey, have a have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yes. Mm -hmm.